all right uh hello welcome to the channel or welcome back excuse my son he is jumping upstairs wow <laughs> okay um so this video is basically a chat with me or a rant on basically how i have been failing at business for three years it's actually been a little bit more than three years um what i could have done differently what i plan to do differently and if you are trying to start a business in 2024 this video is for you or if you're in the same boat as me where you're like you've been trying you've been hacking at this thing and it is not moving um this is also for you because this video is not clickbait like i have actually been failing as far as in comparison to like you know a lot of videos will be like I didn't reach my goals, but I'm like, they've made like 30,000 from their small business or they've made 80,000. And I know that success is different for everybody, but at the same time, people like me, I just reached my 15 sales on Etsy. And again, I started in 2021 and I haven't really started getting sales until the end of 2022. And then slowly throughout 2023, I've actually like started making sales and they are they are not consistent. OK, like that's what I'm saying. Like the last I will say my last four or five sales did come within the last quarter of 2023. But those other sales will be like one, I guess, sell a month, a month goes by, a month goes by. Oh, another sale. And it would be very, very, very random now. I have some things to say about both these platforms and also my own accountability and what could have been done differently and then like what I plan to do differently. So I had made the decision that I wanted to start a business in 2018. And I was like, this, it was my first, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I didn't decide on what I wanted to sell until like 2021. And that was digital products. That's when I made that commitment. And then that's when I opened my Etsy shop with my first digital planner that did not sell at all. Like it is completely discontinued now. And it's a completely different, I actually really like it, but I do want to remake it. Um, but it did, it set in my Etsy shop for probably a year and I didn't touch it. And I'm pretty sure I didn't even have tags. Like I had, I was so done with procrastinating posting products and just doing it that I just opened my Etsy shop I got the name I don't even think I made it in the about section I didn't even I didn't do any of those things I just posted it and I let it sit because I had a newborn at the time so I had a toddler and a newborn and I was like I'm just gonna like and I pretty much left my craft room and I took care of my kids and now you know I have two toddlers, a two-year-old and a four-year-old, so like a toddler and a kid. But, you know, they're a lot more independent um, than they are, you know, obviously when they're newborn. So that obviously played a big role in why, you know, I just simply could not be consistent in anything doing with Etsy or even the social media platforms. Um, and only finally, probably last year, <laughs> which is it's only like January 2nd when I'm filming this. Finally, I was able to get out certain products that I have been wanting to get out for so long. And I'm finally doing what I wanted to do in the first place. So just personal life simply was um, creating like a roadblock in me getting my business started. And it's not a problem. Like it's called life like I had a family to have kids to take care of so no I'm not going to be able to be super consistent and dedicate so much time into um filming this you know I mean uh so much dedicate so much time into this business and what I've been trying to do but slowly but surely right now I did want to talk about the the scamish nature of entrepreneurship and the brutal truth about starting a business so i've been watching free content on youtube on the internet since 2018 a little past that as well but like when i really was trying to do this i was watching so many advice so much advice from youtube all kinds of youtubers and in addition to that like i took 
I took a couple of courses, not like I didn't take those like really expensive courses where you have to do a Zoom call just to find out the price, which I'm going to get to that. Like I have an issue with that. But, you know, I did take some courses and for a long time I was trying to absorb everything I could for free, like obviously. And I did think I was like, well, maybe I'm not as successful as I could be because this is just the free content. And maybe if I pay something, then maybe that'll help me jumpstart. That is not how I feel now. I really, I'm, so I'm going to get into um, the courses, but first I'm going to talk about the fact that when you are looking into starting a business, a lot of people are going to say like, oh, you need, start with a niche, start with a niche, start with a niche. So here's the thing I'll say about that. If you are anything like me with ADHD and you get stuck into these hyper fixations, I will say that if you are naturally, uh, you know, scatterbrain, it's going to be very hard for you to pick a niche because you like, just like me, you might not know what you really want to do. And I just cannot, I don't think I'm capable really of just focusing on one thing. I don't, I just, I've tried many years throughout my high school, college, and even now into adulthood. There are so many ideas, like my, the, the tide, my channel my brand is bunny hop hobbies hobbies because there's not really one thing that i enjoy doing more than the other at different times like i like photography videography i like to roller skate i like graphic design i like um i actually i mean i'm i want to say that i'm a painter but i still i like to paint i like to write i I am into a lot of things. I like to code. I like to try different things. And when people say, you have to niche down, it is incredibly hard for me to do that. And that is a me problem. But if that is a you problem, this is my new strategy for the year. I am starting to realize, especially if if you're going to sell on these platforms, and really I'm starting to say like, every platform like all of these platforms you're going to sell anything um or even try to be a content creator like from social media platforms to marketplace platforms the truth of the matter is they're the platforms care more about themselves than they do the you know users which is not a problem like it's like fair enough like i'm not gonna complain about that because any rational person you know, in order to stay in business, they have to think with a business mindset. Um, but when people say niche down, I decided that this year, because actually I decided this in October. No, not sorry. I decided this last year. So we we're saying last year it was like literally two days ago, but I decided this somewhere in November or December that instead of niching down my entire brand, right, making my brand about one thing. I'm going to niche down on the individual thing. So per video or per product, like per post, have a target audience per thing. I would not, especially if you're like starting out because you have a little bit less to lose. Because if you have been making content, let's say cake decorating content for three years and you're like, well, now I want to try this. It might be a little hard for you to adjust to that, even though that's what I see a lot of people recommend. My strategy is just starting out sporadic, if that's just your nature. Now, if you are already, you already know that your niche, you know your niche and you know your target audience, then I, I say go with it. But if you just are doing, you're just kind of like throwing spaghetti at the wall, I would say, you know, they say don't throw spaghetti at the wall. I say throw spaghetti at the wall. <laughs> but Every time you throw spaghetti at the wall, have one place you want to aim for it, right? So, because, I mean, honestly, I think at the end of the day, you we end up, we all end up throwing spaghetti at the wall if we don't know what we're doing. And so trying to avoid that necessary um, roadblock, you know, you can't avoid it. You know, it's just, that's just, that's part of the sweat equity with um, starting a business. So that's at least what I have observed in this downturn uh, of a business so that's my new technique with the niche um also now we i want to talk about uh, my issues with a lot of 
how do I say this? Guys? I want to talk about my issues with these courses, right? Because during the holidays, it is Scamageddon. And not all courses are scams. However, I have been binge watching a lot of um, MLM content and seeing the predatory nature of these people basically selling a dream. And I have come to this realization of like this scary parallel between entrepreneurship and multi-level marketing and pyramid schemes all have very close um, procedures and it's unsettling especially for me after dedicating so much time to try to start this business and to see these parallels has made me feel very kind of disappointed but you know kind of like a wake-up call as well about the reality the brutal truth about starting a business so when you're looking up this information everyone's gonna say it's hard work it's hard work it's hard work I don't really think they understand like here's the thing that didn't scare me away and I actually don't think that scares most people away so okay all right how would I say this I think a lot of us started at the same place. We had this idea and we said, I, we want to start a business. And we probably went to YouTube or Google to research um, people talking about starting businesses, what you need, this and that. They'll say you need a niche for one. And then two, this happened a lot in 2020 with hustle culture And it's starting, I think people are starting to realize how the truth of the matter is that you are at the mercy of these platforms far beyond what they say. And I didn't, part. I hesitate to say this stuff because, I, I don't know, like, how do I say this? A lot of this, a lot of stuff at least in my observation, has a lot more to do with luck than we are willing to accept. And of course, a coach, a um, instructor or person who sells courses have to say that they have more control than they probably do over the success of someone else's growth because it's hard for me to accept that like if someone's course was so good you would think that the word would get out or maybe it wouldn't right so I can't really make that argument but we have to start asking ourselves if this course was that great where are the people raving about it the same way people rave about their favorite makeup brand or their favorite clothing brand or their favorite school, their favorite college? You would think if there was so much success in this stuff, you know, what what are those, <laughs> you know, just like, where's the hype? You know, I do question that, but I understand If people don't want to say too much about it because, like, you don't want your competitors to know about this great course, and I would like to believe that. But at the same time, I have my doubts. So another parallel that I have started to see with um, pyramid schemes is this idea of, oh, it's going to be hard work. It's going to be hard work. You have to put the work into it. And although I agree with that, I think we all have accepted that. And there's a section, or maybe not all of us, but like there's a good amount of us. I'm pretty confident. Like put in the comments below, if you, you know, you came into, okay, I'm going to start a business and you recognize like, yeah, it's going to be hard work and you weren't afraid. Like I was not afraid of hard work. I don't think a lot of people are afraid of hard work. When they say it's going to be hard work, I feel like this is just a way to protect them from having real accountability on their inability to actually help you succeed because you can always go back to well I told you it was going to be difficult and I told you not everyone's going to do this and they can just basically put that blame oh my gosh they can basically put that blame back onto you 
if you are successful, whether it's their program, whether it's their ebook or anything like that. And fair enough, like you can't, they, like they legally cannot promise you anything, but even if they could legally do it, I don't think that their ability to actually do it and, and again, like I hesitate to say these things just because like this is a hard realization for me, like believing in this um, success of being an entrepreneur and like the thing like this, it, that's the thing. Like I am not in an MLM, but I am an aspiring entrepreneur and seeing these parallels is difficult right like you feel I feel some type of way because I do feel lied to at some degree about the success rate at doing what I do um where are we at time so yeah and it just makes me feel you know it makes you feel a certain type of way and especially being um privy to a lot of these tactics that they use And so, like I said, they'll say, oh, it's hard work, but I'm going to say this. Let me tell you what's hard. One is being consistent um, because that's just naturally going to be hard if you're not used to. If you have to create content, it's going to be hard because you're simply not used to doing it. It takes the time for the brain to create habits and to create the discipline and to know what to do when to do it and things like that that's just uh actually i'm gonna stop the video all right so we are back it looks like it focused so um what was i talking about so all right okay so these the the parallel between mlm culture and entrepreneurship is actually very scary to honestly recognize so now i want to talk about these tactics that I'm seeing um with these courses my first red flag for a course is any course that targets beginners that is priced I would say $30 anything over $30 because it may be a little bit depending on how much work goes into the course um my issue is if you are a beginner and you've never touched, um, you know, anything with starting a business. I think it's a red flag for someone to target you, knowing that you it's a high chance that you might not be committed to this. Right? It's asking for a big commitment from you, and I would say, like, at least if it's like thirty dollars or under, like worst case scenario, you're a beginner, you've never had a digital course before but you spend thirty dollars and you realize like oh i don't want to actually do this i'm not really committed worst case scenario you're out of thirty dollars versus these courses that are probably charging thousands of dollars like that's a big ask for something that for a target market that you know is likely not going to be able to um afford to lose that right and this usually comes from targeting people who are desperate as well and I find that to be a red flag that's so any course that's targeting honestly courses in general that targets beginners but um definitely if they're like charging in the thousands but they're going after people who have never really did this you know um who haven't had the chance to actually um try what they can for free I have no idea what my son is doing upstairs. <laughs> he's with his dad, so like he's not like going wild by himself, but I'm just letting y'all know. But anyways, um another red flag for stuff is not having your price on your website. I can we leave that in 2023? Can we stop with this long sales page and then I have to zoom call you to figure out your price? Now I do see why there's the only argument that I have for that is that when it comes to pricing things, you do sometimes want to eliminate people who are likely to basically waste your time or troll you, or you're trying to like, you know, if people expect a high price rate, you know, they'll just 
avoid it altogether, right? So they just won't even call or ask any questions because if they're expecting something to be very um, expensive, they're just not going to go. This, they're just not going to participate the same way, you know, like um, when you go to the mall and you see those stores and it's like this, you know, like the luxury stores they that make you kind of feel unwelcomed. And you're like, you know, I feel like just breathing in here is too expensive for me. They want that, right? Because that way they're targeting the people that they are likely able to afford what they're asking for. But even if you can afford it, I really get the ick when I have to do a little bit more to just to get the price from you. Because what ends up happening, especially if it's like, oh, get a call, get on a call with me. A lot of that is one to get information for you, probably to add to their stats, right? To see, because if they can ask you your business questions, that'll help them get basically data for what's going on with sellers um, or people who want to be content creators, right? They'll get data from you, one. Two, they'll probably get you into a conversation to make it seem like they care and they'll probably give you like some good advice and they want you to feel like they're giving your giving you value and you have set up here and called them and you've talked to them it's going to make you feel bad if you just hang up the phone and not give them nothing right so they're also banking on reciprocity like oh i'm like oh no i don't want to waste this person's time i've called them and whatever they ask me for and it might not even be the price like that first call might not be where the sale is but it makes you feel like you have to give them something back and so they'll probably have some kind of small ask which is foot in the door technique um it could be like well you know make or well they'll probably set you up with another call because they want you to invest in your time because things that you invest in your time with, you see more value. You, um, They're playing with these sunken cost fallacy where, okay, well, I've already, I've already signed up for this person's email. I've already spent an hour on the conver- conversation phone with them. Um, I'm getting all this value from them. It's, or it's like I've invested all this time for them to this person. They must be, it's gonna, like your brain is gonna trick you into saying like, this must be valuable. I've invested so much. They've given me so much. And so then you're going to be, feel a little bit more responsible for giving something back. Then they're probably going to use um, something like either door in the face. It's going to be a big ask of you. And you're going to, you know, probably like, oh, I don't feel uncomfortable with, I feel uncomfortable with that. You're going to hesitate. And then they're going to lower it so that they can do the price anchoring. <laughs> and then you know they say like well okay i charge 1500 for this service and you're like oh i I don't think i have 1500 and they're like okay okay you know what we could do to we can do a payment plan of 200 a month so they're getting 200 a month but to you 200 compared to 15 is a big difference but they were kind of being prepared for that 200 in the first place they were already prepared to knock that price down for you um and then that is the um door in, that's the door in the face because you're much more likely to you know like you get this big number you get or it's a big number or it's a big commitment whatever they ask for you and you were like whoa that's a lot but that makes you a lot more likely to go with the smaller thing but the smaller thing would not be as small if it was just up front and say well how about 200 a month and that was the original ask it's a lot easier for you to say no i i I, this isn't what i'm looking for but feeling like you have a deal after the door in the face technique there's also the foot in the door and this is also working when you um you know you give your email you get a freebie you get something like oh well i'm charging a small amount for this and a small amount for that and it's like price anchoring again where Price anchoring and sunken cost fallacies are working together to get you to go like a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, right? Now, these techniques are all throughout marketing everywhere. I don't think that by themselves automatically is bad. It depends on a lot of other things. But to me, again, it comes back to targeting who's your target market, like who's your target audience. Um, If you are targeting beginners, I think these cognitive uh, psychology tactics are a bit 
they give me the ick. I'm gonna because it's not technically a scam. It there's always like a degree to things, um, but it gives you the ick when you actually see like what the process is. So another thing I want to talk about a lot of these courses is where. So what they're gonna do is so this is where I feel like you know the truth, the blunt truth about starting a business is. With all of this free content, they're going to start with the dream. They're going to say it's possible. They're going to give you all of these survivor, um, was it survivor bias stuff? They're going to give you all the testimonials, right? And they're going to say it's so possible. Like, this is your way to success. Like, you're going to be successful. Like, this is possible. Like, if you just put in the work, you just put in the work. And then they use these words, possible. And And this is why I say the parallels were, like, scary. Because, again, I'm sitting here watching MLM content, But I'm like, this is like such parallel to entrepreneurship as well. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like I was feeling some type of way because like it is something I'm trying to, I just, all I want guys is a small business and I just want to make stuff so that people can make stuff. Like that is where my niche is, you know, um, what's my, my slogan is I design digital tools for aspiring and fellow creatives with a focus on wellness productivity and creativity right that's that's it it's not really that deep you know and that's just what I I felt like there's nothing wrong with pursuing that and listening to how you know you know like just seeing these parallels with like they sell you this dream so many youtubers and it is the, the scary part about it right even in a scam right even with scams it's still possible for you to be successful but scams are they're not it's not a black and white thing and that's why we have this gradient of like oh is this ethical or you know it it, just because all right i'll say this just because it's not a scam doesn't mean it's not ethical or doesn't mean how am I saying this something a business model you can have an ethical business model but have okay you you get what I'm trying to say you can have a legit business model and still have unethical practices okay is what I'm trying to say so just because it's not illegal or just because it's not flat out a scam doesn't mean that you can't be scammy in the way that you attempt to do certain things and i just feel like a lot of um youtube business gurus are not upfront about a lot of things and there's a lot of hoops that i see some of them jump through um and this isn't all of them i think a lot of them there are good people who do truly believe that they can help you I do believe that they believe that but I am not convinced that a course is actually going to help you um or is how do I say this okay this was another red flag that I noticed with courses um if a course seller or a coach is hung up on testimonials (laughs) And especially if those testimonials are of the same people. I feel some type of way about that. Like, you don't have any new students that are doing better. Like, you don't have any more. Um, I'm looking at the time. The is like, I mean, if you've been in business, especially people who are like, oh, we've been um in business for like 10 years and we've been selling this course for five years and for five years they still are hung up on that one or two, it's like all of five people who did well with the course and like part of me is like was it the course that was why they did well or is these people are these the people that um we're gonna do well regardless and I have definitely been in that scenario like when I was in high school you know high schools y'all already know how high schools and colleges will do with their good with the exceptional students they'll try to take credit right for like oh look at this exceptional student um at our school right but really like what that student probably that student probably had what it would have taken anyways no matter where you put them would probably have done what they 
did was under in the first place. And so when the testimonials are slim, that's a red flag for me. Like it's hard for me to justify someone talking about a course when they don't have that many people success they don't have enough success stories for me like they'll be like oh well, so and so and so and it's like all of 10 people i'm like that does that's not like how many well i don't know the and that's nothing like what's the ratio of students see because like if it's a university you know a university's retention rate you know a u- university's dropout rate a university's graduation rate you have all of those things all of those things are public with a university so you have a lot more information but when it comes to these online courses you know people are like oh we've had thousands of students and for me i'm just like okay for how long like is it a thousand per year or some total of you been on um selling this course and of those thousand people, how many people have been successful? Like, what's the ratio to that? And until people, like, if you don't disclose those numbers, is again, I, it's hard for me to justify, you know, especially, it, so you don't have your price on your website. You don't disclose the retention rate and the success rate per, per year, right? Like a university does or something like, you don't disclose that you target beginners um it looks it gives me the ick i'm gonna say that technically there's reasons why you don't disclose prices is because you're trying to find your target audience and i understand that but at the same time you know if you're targeting beginners not disclosing the price trying to bank on reciprocity you give a lot of free stuff um which is again like everybody does it even i have like freebies um but my freebies i've been trying to like have a freebie because i understand that a lot of people have never like a lot of people aren't familiar with digital products generally so like i try to give a freebie so that you can like try it out before you commit to um commit to buying something you know, and it's not necessarily about, you know, it's, it's definitely the beginning of my funnel. Um, but it's not like, a, it's not, it's just me really wanting people like, well, before you buy this, like, we, like, you know, it's, it's more like a sample. Like, yeah, you are likely to actually buy um, the actual product if you get free samples, but you also still get the free sample. It's not like they're going to trick you. Well, hopefully not, because I guess the trick would be, if you get a free sample of an ice cream flavor and that flavor does taste nothing like the sample, you know what I mean? Like that's a trick versus, okay, here's a free sample. And if you like the ice cream and you buy it, then I think that's completely ethical. That's just my personal opinion versus I'm going to give you this, um, this free information. And then when you're leaving the grocery store, then you're like, Hey, um, remember I gave you that free ice cream. So like, you're gonna like buy the ice cream or something or you know like that i think that's a little weird so targeting beginners not disclosing price um what was the other banking on reciprocity reciprocity door in the face techniques foot in the door techniques when that's all of it um low testimonials like not having enough testimonials is weird especially if you've been doing this for a while like people who've been here coaches that say they've been doing this for probably 10 years or something like where are all the people like that believe in this course and I just can't help but I don't know like the only thing that I think is the most valuable thing for a course is hot um leads actually the battery's about to die and this is about to stop so I'm gonna pause it here come back to it and then hopefully finish within like 10 minutes of next video um, so this is edit Brie. <laughs> Literally as I was editing this. Isn't it crazy? Like I'm actually editing and the same day I made a video. But um like where's my scarf going? Anyways, um I had I realized that I dropped off in the middle of a thought about what I think a true valuable course is going to be, and that is hot leads. <laughs> not I'm gonna say not even warm leads especially not cold leads but i think that 
like at least for me like you're gonna find value in what you find value in but for me if I am even considering buying a course especially if it's like a hundred plus dollars especially especially if it's like in the thousands range or something I need to know that this person already knows where my audience is so if I were to get on a call they need to and I tell them like what I do what I make what my product or service is they they I need to hear oh okay I actually know where your target market hangs out um and I actually have customers ready for you that um is pretty much where I am this that is because there's gonna okay courses that just tell you how to do something without doing something for you like either they have to do it for you like if you are um like if you need a, let's say a social media a social media a social media management a social media manager needs to manage the social media not tell you i mean obviously it's probably going to be both like they're going to give you advice on what you can do but to me the value of me getting a social media manager is for them to actually do and manage the social media not teach me if that makes sense you know what i mean and the other thing that i think is valuable in a course is if you're actually buying something in return even if it is a digital so i do think like if it's a template like i am receiving a template back not just information itself or if it is like is very specific information like a design course like there's a course and it's like oh i teach you how to make cartoon characters by the end of that course you could you okay so by the end of that course you should be able to draw the cartoon characters that they said that you were going to be able to draw now of course no coach or teacher or instructor can force students to learn but if that makes sense like it's sh- by the end of the course i should have a thing i should have something close to what was promised if someone's like well i can teach you i don't know like a course is like oh, i can teach you how to grow your business i feel like it's a lot it's way too vague like because technically if i take a course and I get one more sale that's technically growing my business you know what I mean so that's just my input so um but yeah back to regular video all right and we are back okay so as I was saying what makes which what gives me the ick with coaches or course creators are course creators and coaches who target beginners um, don't disclose their price on the website and bank on reciprocity, cognitive bias, or all of the, or door in the face or foot in the door, price anchoring. I would say like, I'm okay with price anchoring. I'm okay with foot in the door. I'm okay with door in the face techniques. Um, if they're authentic but it's hard to actually prove they're authentic but like using all of the things i just listed then it, i think it's, it gives me the ick and these are the parallels that i've been seeing with trying to be an entrepreneur especially taking advice from anybody off the internet so those were the things that i don't like about the courses um and the general stuff that's going on on the internet now um Okay, so I think that's everything. If I can think of something else during edit, I might edit it in. But thanks for watching. Uh, You know, I don't even know. Hit the subscribe button, like button if you want to keep up with my inconsistent schedule. (laughs) But, I mean, hey, if if you like the video, at least give it a like. And I will catch you hopefully soon. And hopefully I can get a lot more consistent in 2024. But. Thanks for watching.